like to um, now invite David DeLima up, and David's been here a number of times before. He's friends uh, with us in Clear Vision Church, so um, I'll ask him to come now. Thanks, David. Thank you, Ray, for your warm introduction. It's good to be sharing with you on behalf of our ministry, Family Voice Australia, and today we're going to be looking at a very important message, which I hope will be of benefit to you at Clear Vision as you want to get your vision clear. You want to get clarity of vision. Our message today is entitled Affirming the Image of God Within Humanity. So I hope we'll get a clear vision as to that as we look at four areas. Firstly, the consequences of rejecting God's image in mankind. And secondly, the creational status of mankind. Thirdly, the redemptive potential of mankind. And fourthly and finally, impressing an awareness of God's image and purpose as we are dealing one with another and reaching out to the world that God loves. So we begin with a quotation from Mother Teresa, a very keen believer, who said famously, I see God in every human being. I see God in every human being. Well, unfortunately, we do not see ourselves that way when we're apart from Christ. And even as God's people, we slip back into worldly thinking from time, don't we? But, you know, human beings are are people who have a tendency to deny what we call the creational and redemptive truth that each person is made by God and for God and in the image or likeness of God and to be a temple or a vessel of the Spirit of God. Those are the four things that we can say about human beings. If only we could understand that simple truth that human beings are made by God and they're made for God and they are made in the image or likeness of God and they are to be a temple or a vessel of the Spirit of God. When we forget those truths, we have awful attacks on the sanctity of life that may include homicide, there's oppression, and self-harm. So homicide, the taking of life, it's occurring all the time. There's the killing of the unborn, there's the killing of the newborn, there's the killing of the handicapped and elderly. These are occurring in the belief that human life is somehow expendable. We're forgetting the truth about human life. It stems, you know, from rebellion towards God that we read in Genesis 4 as Cain killed his brother Abel because Cain uh, was failing to honour their heavenly father. And then we have oppression, the problem of oppression. There's human commodification, there's rape, there's injustice, there's slavery. These things arise when we reject Almighty God as our creator. And yet the book of Proverbs is so helpful for us in chapter 14. He who oppresses the poor shows contempt for their maker. It's true that so many of these problems arise because we simply cannot get our mind around the truth that we are made in the image of God. Self-harm is another issue that's arising in our world. And with this coronavirus, I'm told that the suicide rate is going up. People are feeling depressed and upset and losing the will to live. That's tragic. In fact, in this time of lockdown, we should be enriching relationships because families are sort of stuck together. But unfortunately, by denying these truths of God, we're wasting that ministry opportunity in our families. Self-harm is occurring. There's suicide, there's compulsive behaviour. Behavior. We've got eating disorders out there. These problems arise because people have identities that are damaged. Now, this often follows from abuse and neglect in families, although it can, of course, be through demonic influence. We think of that possessed man in the book of Mark, chapter 5, the possessed man at Gerasa, who was damaging himself because of that demonic oppression. So there are all sorts of reasons why people engage in self-harm. And tragically, in the United States, back in 2005, there was a terrible, sad combination of self-harm and human commodification. There's a lady there by the name of uh, Carolyn Smith, 
and she was a single mother. She needed money for the education of her son. So she got this wild idea that she would auction her forehead as advertising space. And so she put out her forehead for auction and the highest bidder would get a message tattooed permanently on her forehead. And the Golden Palace Casino in the United States came up with the winning bid of 10,000 US dollars. And so for the rest of her life, goldenpalace.com is tattooed permanently on her forehead. Now, that's just tragic. You know, would to God that the people of God in the United States might have been able to step in there and uh, provide the money for the remedial surgery. And why is it that people find themselves in these financial difficulties in the first place? So there's much more that we as God's people can be doing as we deal with the consequences of rejecting God's image in mankind. And secondly today we'll look at the creational status of mankind. So having sketched the bad news now we're getting into the good news. The creational status of mankind. Firstly we are made by God. Secondly we are made for God. Thirdly in his image. That's the way creation works. It's as simple as that. Now it's true that all things through him were made, as we read in John chapter 1. And though we are amazed by every part of nature, it's we human beings who are especially incredible because we are the most complicated and sophisticated of all the creatures. Uh, Homo sapien, wise man, as they say. And, you know, each person is uniquely fashioned. Your fingerprints are unique, your eyes are unique, your ears are unique. Uh, and every, every part of our body is unique. And man is the pinnacle or the summit of creation. God has crowned him with glory and honor, we read in Psalm 8. And for that reason, we see that humanity is listed as the last and concluded, the final work of creation as described for us in Genesis chapter 1. So there are two ways in which the created order is described in scripture for us in the first and in the second chapter and humanity is listed as the last in Genesis 1 but the first in chapter 2. So clearly we, we can't harmonize those chronologically. We've got to recognize that there's a theological point being made here. So in chapter 1 mankind is listed as the last, the concluding, the final glorious pinnacle of creation and we'll get to chapter 2 in just a second as we look at this second aspect indeed of our created status which is to say that not only are we made by God but we are made for God. Now it's true that all things were created by him and for him as Paul writes to the Colossians in the first chapter of his letter to Colossae but you know humanity we have a special responsibility as what we may term the prime steward of creation. We as his people are the prime steward of creation. The other animals and creatures there, they're going about their God-ordained work, but they're not running the cosmos as it were. They're not supervising the globe. Whereas human beings are called to tend the garden and to take care of it. We have a special responsibility as the number one steward over all of creation. So we have the leading role in the created order and for that reason we are listed as the first and the foremost creation in Genesis chapter 2. So it's fascinating to read those two accounts of creation. One is asserting that we are the final and concluding glorious work of creation in chapter 1 but in chapter 2 we are the first and foremost because we have the priority as the prime or number one steward of creation. I hope I'm making myself clear as we look at those two various accounts of the created order in scripture. So we are to be placed by God in, in his garden to work it and take care of it. We're not to rape and plunder the cosmos. We are to wonderfully tend the garden to make it more fruitful and make it more wonderful and beautiful and more productive for us there. And we are to name all of the animals. You see, we are made for God to do that work. He doesn't name the animals. He delegates that task to us. 
The scripture says he names the stars. I suppose the reason for that is because throughout most of human history we've not been able to see too many of the stars. You can see about 2,000 stars as you look up each night, uh, but it's only with the invention of the telescope and the camera. Both must work together to capture the light, to, to magnify it and to capture it so that we can see what's going on there. And of course there are as many stars in the universe as there are grains of sand uh, on the seashores of the earth, so they tell me. Uh, so it would be very difficult to name them, but God names the stars we read in Scripture, but he doesn't name the animals. That task has been delegated to you and me. It's a lawmaking task. It's a supervisory task, because when you name something, you are in a sense controlling it. So in, in the best sense, we are supervising creation, not only as we work it and take care of it, but as we name all the animals. And there are still species out there wonderfully waiting discovery and waiting to be named. Well, no other creature has such stewardship of nature. So while all things were created by him and for him, we have a special role as the first and foremost creation, the prime steward of the cosmos. And the third point we can make today about our created status is that all of us, whether we're in Christ or not, we are made in the image of God. This is a wonderful starting point for evangelism and outreach, really, is to help people to realize that whether they are accepting God or not, or whether they're even not necessarily believing in him, yet they are made in his image. And for that reason, we love and reverence all people. Well, the divine character is seen in every part of creation, it's understood from being what has been made, as Paul writes to the Romans. So we, we get an understanding of who God is by looking at any aspect of creation. His fingerprints are everywhere, we might say. However, humans, above all, in the natural order, are the main created witnesses to God's personality. So yes, you can look at a leaf or a spider or a butterfly and you can know that God is very clever, he's very artistic, he's a fantastic engineer. But it's when we look at human beings that we're really starting to get detail about the character and quality of God. You see, we are the only species to bear the image of the one who announced back at the beginning of creation, let us make man in our image, in our likeness. We read that in Genesis chapter 1. So we are not like God in the sense of being as equal. Uh, it would be wrong to, be, to try to make ourselves equal to God. But we are still like God because we are in his likeness. And so our children, especially growing up, ought to be able to see something of the character of God in their mother and father because their mother and father are authentically demonstrating the divine qualities. But they're found in all human beings who love their children, as Jesus said. So, we reflect who God is. That's what it means to be made in the image of God. Jesus said that all earthly fathers love their children, even evil ones. So we just can't help ourselves. We're a chip off the old block, we might say. Each human being, uh, even when we're apart from Christ and in rebellion towards God, we still just can't help ourselves to demonstrate so many aspects of his personality, especially as we love our children. And human beings, we have the capacity to appreciate creativity and compassion and beauty and irony and humour. And we have the ability to make promises, to pray. We can laugh. We can intentionally procreate. We can comprehend kinship, those that we're in relationship with. We can contemplate ancestry. We can contemplate posterity, future generations. And we are aware of our own mortality. So as far as I'm aware, such awareness is unique to humanity. We're very different from the animals and all of the other created elements in the world. It's because we're made in the image of God. However, it's that sinful choice that has compromised this glorious state, even though we're made by God for him and his image, because of our sin, because of our rebellion, all of the above is deeply and profoundly compromised. 
In fact, in our evil, as Paul writes to the Romans in chapter 1 of his letter, he says, we invent ways of doing evil. What could be more grievous to the heart of God than when his creation puts thought and expertise in creativity into evil instead of into what is good? We therefore tend to regard ourselves and others as having no inherent value. We can treat one another like pawns on the chessboard, and we've certainly seen that throughout history. We may regard ourselves and others as having no inherent value, and we're just expendable. So we've had these countless rejections of the profoundly special status of each human being by God denying individuals and their philosophy. We think of communism and Nazism and Stalinism and all these other isms. Uh, when we elevate any philosophy, of course, it becomes a rival to worshipping God himself, and uh, it's uh, downhill from there. But those philosophies tend to regard people as objects that are sellable, despicable, and disposable. And so under some of those regimes that I've mentioned, it didn't matter if people were starved to death because we need their money in order to buy guns or we need their money in order to buy uh, foreign machines in order to build up the former Soviet Union, for example. And so unfortunately, people are disposable. They're able to be despised. They're despicable. And they're able even to be sold. And still, slavery is alive and well uh, in the world today. In fact, it's probably never been so cheap to buy a slave. I'm told you can buy a slave in Africa for about 20 US dollars. And I met someone once that had bought a number of slaves in order to give them their freedom. What a wonderful thought that was. Uh, he made them work for their freedom because that way he can spend more money on more slaves and give more of them their freedom. But uh, uh, he's certainly thinking outside the box as he's upholding the image of God in humanity. But you know, as we recognise our created status, we comprehend the great need to be reconciled to our creator and therefore with all humanity. And we're grieved by those selfish ideologies that deny honour and protection and blessing to others. I hope today that we're grieved as we watch the daily news and see what's going on uh, and that we will do more than be grieved, that we'll be motivated by the love of Christ constraining us in order to reach out and indeed to declare what is now for us the third aspect of our message today, which is to look at the redemptive potential of mankind. The redemptive potential. So human beings are made by God, for God, in his image, and in Christ we are able to rise up to this wonderful opportunity to become the vessels or the temple of God so that his Holy Spirit will live in our hearts as we have professed saving faith in our Lord Jesus. Thank God that he sent Jesus so that in our rebellion we are rescued and we can take up to its fullness what it means to be made by God and for him and in his image and to be his vessel. So sin and guilt brings separation from God that profoundly damages our status, our created status, our self-concept, our relationships, our ability to steward nature. What a mess we've made up of stewarding nature, by the way. All the pollution that's out there, at least with the coronavirus now, where some of our cities are starting to get a bit cleaned up. I hope it won't be business back to normal when the virus is over, but rather that we will apply some of the lessons that we've learned in, in better managing uh, the cosmos instead of wrecking it. Well, above all, we rejoice that by faith in Jesus we receive forgiveness. And that gives us a restored creational standing. And it gives us a new perspective because we can now become agents of renewal and reconciliation. So these words of scripture in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 come to mind. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. From now on, Paul writes, from now on we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone. 
the new has come. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. So here we are in the Clear Vision Church. I hope we're getting a clear vision today that because we are reconciled with God, we now have a commission to engage in the ministry of reconciliation. As God's ambassadors, we are called, equipped by this vision, impelled by this vision, constrained by the love of Christ, to help the whole world understand that we are made by God and for God and in the image of God and to be the vessels of the Spirit of God. What a grand vision it is that we have as God's people. We are saved by God and we are being conformed to the likeness of his Son, as Paul writes to the Romans in chapter 8 of his letter. We are being conformed to the likeness of his Son. That means that as I grow in my Christian walk, you should be able to look at me and say, yep, he's becoming increasingly conformed to the likeness of Jesus. I'm not sure if that's the case as you look at me. But that's my prayer. And for all of us today, each day as we grow in Christ, may we be increasingly conformed to the likeness of his Son. We're looking more like Jesus every day. We're speaking more like Jesus every day. We are presenting God as Father as Jesus presented his God and Father. We're presenting that more accurately and passionately each day because we are being conformed to the likeness of God's Son. How wonderful that is. How tragic that our churches tend to get a bit stale, a bit mundane, a bit ho-hum, a bit same old, same old. Would to God that in the same way that our Lord Jesus, when he was walking on earth, he just kept astonishing people by what he was doing. And people were amazed. They were overwhelmed by him. You see, that's how I should be living my life. Because each day I'm being increasingly conformed to the likeness of his son. I'm being squeezed into the right shape, as it were. So that each day I'm increasingly looking more and more Christ-like. That's my prayer for myself and for all of us today as we get this clear vision. You see, we're gaining God's perspective. That's what it means to be conformed to the likeness of the Son of God. It is to gain that divine perspective, that divine vision, that divine outlook. This just transforms how we treat people. You see... Worldly people get sick of the problems out there and they shut the door and say, I haven't got time for this nonsense. But in Christ, we are able to look beyond people who are wounded, people who are cruel, people who are unlovely, people who are ungrateful, people who are self-damaging, because we can see the image of God. We're being conformed to the likeness of his Son, And therefore we get a different outlook on people. We don't dismiss them because they are wounded, cruel, unlovely, ungrateful or self-damaging. But we say, aha, this is my ministry opportunity because I'm able to see beyond that because I'm taking on a Christ-like perspective, a Christ-like vision for the opportunity to change people as we reveal the gospel to them. We can look differently as we understand that all human beings are made by God, for God, in his image and to be vessels of his spirit. That means we can look at children differently. You know, when the children were brought to Jesus, the disciples said, oh, get those children away, don't disturb us. But Jesus said, no, let the children come to me because such is the kingdom of God. And we are to have that Christ-like faith that childlike faith, I should say, uh, as we recognise that children are portraying the pre-fall state, shall we say, the pre-fall state. It sets a standard of faith according to the Lord's words in Matthew chapter 18. 
And when we look at a woman, we shouldn't look lustfully, we men at least, but we should see someone who is bearing the image of the divine bride. Wow. And as we look at every man, we should see someone who is bearing the image of the divine husband. You see, our sexual difference and our capability as human beings to connect with one another physically and intimately, it's to be a testimony of the divine union. That should powerfully influence how we think about each other and treat each other. Reverencing every person as a unique expression of God's image means that we can reach out to curb injustice and oppression because we recognize that whoever is kind to the needy honors God, according to Proverbs chapter 14. Whoever is kind to the needy honors God. Why? Because people are made in the image of God, by him and for him, and to be his vessels. So this should give us a great ambition to reach out to the needy. In fact, Jesus stands in the place of all the oppressed, all the poor, the unlovely, the unborn facing abortion, the elderly who are being rejected and perhaps at risk of euthanasia. In fact, anyone whose body or mind is ruined, but you know, the spirit, even in someone whose mind or body is utterly ruined, the spirit is whole. The body and mind may be utterly ruined, but the spirit is whole. The spirit is complete. And our task is to love and nurture people, even those who are in a state of ruination. So we don't just bump people off, as it were, but we nurture and reverence everyone. Jesus is standing in the place of everyone in need. He said concerning the needy, whatever you did, for the, le- for the least of one of these brothers of mine you did for me. And further, it means that we are encouraging everyone to profess faith in Jesus as the only way to regain our creational purpose and to achieve reconciliation with God. So he delivers us from sin and death. Thank God, because sin and death impact human activity terribly. Guilty people are afraid to love and serve our Heavenly Father. Guilty people are afraid to come into church. The reasons why people don't come to church are as long as you're around. At our church a few years ago, there was a young guy that came in and uh, I was chatting to him and welcoming him, you know, new to the church. I said, do you live around this way? He said, yeah, live nearby. A few weeks later, he came up to me again and he said, look, uh, I need to apologize to you because I lied to you about where I lived because I don't live nearby. I live miles away. And I said, oh, did you feel unable to tell me that you live miles away rather than nearby? And he said, yeah, I was afraid when you found out that I don't live nearby, you wouldn't let me come to church. I thought, goodness me, I would never have made that one up. That the reasons why people self-disqualify, guilty people are afraid and they, they, they invent reasons why they won't come to church, invent reasons why they won't respond to the gospel. Would to God that we can break through with the love of God and find whatever these strange self disqualifications and just lay them at the foot of the cross and say to those people, uh, there is nothing that can separate us from the love of God. And no matter what you think and no matter what you've done, the blood of Christ avails for us and his sacrifice is sufficient. What a relief. Thank God for Jesus. Friends, we are redeemed by the precious blood of Christ in First Peter chapter 1. The blood of Christ in Scripture is called precious. That's because... It's so wonderfully useful because it gives us the ability to be forgiven from our sins. Let's not keep this good news to ourselves. Let's recognize that we are God's workmanship, created in Christ to do good works. I'm amazed by the number of people in church, not necessarily this one, but out there generally, people who are not ambitious to do good works. But you know, friends, We are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works. I wish I could have a thousand lifetimes to give to the Lord so that I could do more good works. Not that I'm trying to earn salvation, 
Salvation is a free gift. But because we are saved and because we're being conformed to the likeness of his son, we're so ambitious to get out there and help people to realize that, don't you know that we're made by God and we're made for God and we're made in his image and to be vessels of his Holy Spirit. Well, I can only have one lifetime, but if I'm smart in the way I do my ministry, I'll multiply my efforts a thousandfold, which will effectively give me like a thousand lifetimes. So very important that we all take on that approach. It's good to do the work, but much smarter and more efficient to also equip others to do the work so that increasingly we do less and less of the work ourselves, especially those in leadership, and more of equipping others because we are all God's workmanship and we are all created in Christ Jesus to do good works. So today, if you are not doing good works, then I say to you in the Lord's name, you are God's workmanship and you are created in Christ Jesus to do good works. So let's get on with it. We are able also to respond to that wonderful instruction in Scripture where Paul says, Your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you. You were bought at a price, therefore, honor God with your body. It's such a simple test that we can apply when we are doing or saying things that we shouldn't do. Is this honoring God? It's such a simple test. If only I could learn before opening my big mouth or doing some stupid thing. Is this honoring God? We're called to honor God with our bodies because we are bought at a price and because our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Christians, we need to think very carefully about what we do with our bodies. What are we putting into our bodies? Both through the mouth and through the eyes and through the ears. Uh, what YouTube clips are we watching? Can we say that we are able to do that openly or would we prefer that people not check the history of our YouTube watching? What are we putting into our bodies? What thoughts are coming into our minds? Are we honouring God with our body? Well, we need to sort ourselves out in that respect and we need to encourage others towards the loving actions which flow from the restored condition and finally today our role to impress upon others an awareness of God's image and purpose I'm very encouraged by a very short prayer uttered by an interesting fellow who has a rather interesting and complicated name Pierre Teilhard de Chardin I've been practicing that uh, now we wouldn't agree with everything that Pierre Teilhard de Chardin said or stood for, but he got this bit right, and I like to call this the prayer of Pierre Théard de Chardin. He prayed as follows, Grant me to recognize in other men, Lord God, the radiance of your own face. What a lovely prayer that is. Grant me to recognize in other men, Lord God, the radiance of your own face. You see, we don't see the radiance of God in others. We see them as unlovely. We see them as ungrateful. We see them as broken. We see them as greedy. We see them as troublemaking. And all of that is true. But we need to look beyond the flesh to take on that divine perspective to recognize that even these evildoers are made by God for God in his image and to be vessels of his spirit. So that prayer, so valuable. Help us, Lord, to recognize the way in which human beings bear the radiance of God's own face. As we apply that, uh, that profound approach, may we sensitively impress upon others not only the creational reality and the redemptive potential, but also that all of us are called to join a world-transforming multitude which can astound others. Everyone is called to join the family of God through Jesus. I had a friend once and he was ministering to some poor young woman out there on the street and she was in a, a bad way and as he was ministering he was praying, Lord, how can, I, how can I impress upon this young woman the love of God? How can I impress upon this young person that she's, she's made by God? She's made for God 
in his image and to be the vessel of his Holy Spirit. If only she could understand that and be released from the terrible bondage that she's facing. Well, this has implications not only for the individual but for the entire transformation of communities. How good it is that whole communities, not just the individual, but whole communities can respond to the gospel and to the recognition of Jesus as Lord. I've mentioned some of those famous atheist ideologies already today. Now, it's true that there are individual atheists who might well give value to the person, but atheism, all these isms, atheism has not formed the agencies, the institutions which have served at the forefront of humanitarian relief. But it's the Christian faith, isn't it, which has asserted the creational purpose and the redemptive potential of mankind and has founded some really wonderful ministries that are out there. Uh, And all these ministries, of course, need to be refreshed and renewed, just like if you don't clean out the fridge, things are going to go rotten. But uh, they have a powerful Christian foundation, and would to God that they can go back to their foundation. But some wonderful works have been done in the name of the Lord through groups like the Red Cross uh, and the Salvation Army. The Red Cross was founded in 1863, Salvation Army a little later in 1865 and the St John's Ambulance of course the the saint bit sort of gives it away but uh, a work founded by Christians in the 12th century would you believe all those years ago Christians out of their perception that human beings are made by and for God in his image and to be vessels of his spirit wouldn't let people just die by the roadside as it were and so still today the ambulance will go past and, and it's not called St John's Ambulance anymore, it's called Ambulance SA here in South Australia at least. They've sort of dropped the Christian bit, but the cross of Christ is still to be seen on the side of the ambulance. I suppose the iconography is the last thing to go. But would to God that some of these institutions be called back to their Christian roots. Um, we, we still have in hospitals what may be called the, the nursing sister. And the sister, of course, is someone who coming out of the medieval era, uh, has made a profession of faith in Christ. And Florence Nightingale had a wonderful vision for prayerful nurses, nurses who would begin the day with Christian prayer and out of their Christian conviction they would not only help the needy but they would love the needy. Wonderful thought. Without awareness of our creational state and our redemptive potential, at best there's going to be a weak response to the problems facing humanity. That's why atheism and the God-denying ideologies have not produced institutions such as the Red Cross, the Salvation Army and St John's Ambulance. These things have come out of Christian conviction. But in fact we get the opposite coming out of these God-denying ideologies. We have incalculable suffering and death emerging from those Isms, those things which elevate an ideology above God. But it's the care for the needy arising from the Christian faith that's such a powerful means of commending the faith. You see, as Christians, we don't simply have a good vision and we don't simply have good intentions, but we've got actions. And as the old saying goes, actions speak louder than words, or as Jesus said, by their fruit you will know them. It's not just those who talk the talk, but those who walk the walk who make the transformation. It's so important for us today to do good works, not out of a sense of guilt or obligation, but because we are genuinely being conformed to the pattern of Christ and we would love those who are incapable of loving us back, it would seem, at times. There's a great famous atheist by the name of Malcolm Muggeridge. He was in fact one of the founders of our ministry which used to be called Festival of Light before we changed the name to Family Voice Australia and as a great atheist for many years he was the editor of Punch magazine and he used to always criticise Christians. You see he had intellectual difficulties with the faith and it would be a mistake I think to try to fire back intellectually to him because These aren't really issues of the mind so much as the heart. And it was the heart change that he needed and which he received when he 
visited India and Africa and saw the good works there. And there's a fascinating interview which you can see on YouTube where he's being interviewed by the Observer newspaper because after many years of atheism, the love of God was able to penetrate his hardness and cause him to respond in, sa in saving faith as he professed faith in Christ. And he, he said in that interview, I've spent a number of years in India and Africa where I found much righteous endeavor undertaken by Christians of all denominations, but I never, as it happens, came across a hospital or an orphanage run by the Fabian Society or a humanist leper colony. In other words, he's saying the hospitals, the orphanages, they're not being run by the Fabians, by this God-denying group of people. And who's caring for the lepers? Who's running those leprosariums, those leper colonies, in order to minister the love of God and to assist those people suffering from leprosy? It's not the humanists. It's the Christians who are doing it. And he was particularly taken by that demonstration of the love of God that he saw through Mother Teresa. And as a result of interviewing her and seeing her in action, he was able to look very deeply at the value and efficacy of the isms that he held on to, and he was able to throw them into the rubbish bucket where they belonged and to profess faith in Christ. He was very impressed by Mother Teresa, who wonderfully said in an interview with Time magazine back in 1989, the dying, the cripple, the mentally ill, the unwanted, the unloved, they are Jesus in disguise. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for this reminder from Scripture today that we are made by you, we're made for you, we're made in your image and to be the vessel or the temple of your Holy Spirit. Help us to get a clear vision about those four profound truths. Help us to be conformed to the likeness of Jesus as the Holy Spirit dwells within each one who professes saving faith in Christ. That that Holy Spirit would whisper to us and guide us and that we would be greatly encouraged deeply within, not simply to do good works as it were for the sake of them, not to do good works out of some sense of obligation or a feeling of guilt, but with a genuine affection and love for those who are in need. Help us to get that vision right, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.